Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good morning, sorry. Good morning and Happy New Year to everybody. It's now 2023, so uh, lost for days. Hope you've all had a good Christmas, prosperous New Year, and let's see what's going to happen in this year. Surely can't be any worse than last. Right. Can we have some apologies, please? Yes, uh, we have apologies from Councillor McGrath. Okay, so there's a couple of name, a couple of people here not yet, so we'll see if they turn up. Otherwise, we'll move on. Um, and I see we've got Councillor Trotman here. Um, welcome, Tony, and you will be wanting to ask a question at some point, and I'll more than welcome to do that. Okay. So minutes to previous meeting. Uh, so are the committee ha happy to me to move the minutes we had on the 8th of November last year? Um, if they are a true record, and if they are, can I have a second of that, please? That's for Councillor Parks. Uh, are there any objections? Anybody got any concerns from that, from that last one? No? So if that, then all in favour of that, we'll put that through, yeah? All in favour, please? Thank you. It's moved. Declarations of interest. So are there any declarations of disclosable interest or dispensations as granted by the Standards Committee? There appears to be none, so I'll make very quickly through on the Chairman's announcements. Um, to bring the Select Committee up to date with the meetings that I have attended in my capacity as Chairman of the Environment Select Committee, since the last meeting on the November, I've had meetings uh, with the Financial Planning Task Group, the Quarter 1 Budget Monitoring, that was held on the 11th of November 2022, and then on the financial plan task group on the 25th of November. And I've also received briefings on the following. The um, LHFIG, the left hand fix, speed surveys, 6th of December. And future Chippenham briefing on the 12th of December, which was the day before the cabinet. Um, nothing else to report on that. So public participation. Unless anybody got any questions on those seems so long ago, I can't remember. So much has happened since. Public participation, I don't think there's any today. So the main agenda items, we'll move to that now. And can I gently remind you members, during our forthcoming discussions, to keep any statements to a minimum. Try not to be parochial about your little areas and questions and less to illustrate a broader point about policy services or delivery because I'm a two-hour meeting man. I don't like going over two hours. I'd like this to be switched on all the way through. And if we get finished before, better. Item six, update on the town's programme app development. So on item six on the agenda is an update on the town's programme, the app development, which is on pages 11 to 18. This item is going to be a presentation. And introducing this, we have Councillor Nabil Najjar. He's the portfolio holder for arts, heritage and tourism. And welcome to the Select Committee, Nabil. We're also joined by Victoria Maloney, Head of Economic and Generation, Tony Bracher, 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 oh, thank you, and the Heritage um, Services Manager. I think we've got Rory Brown. Is that right? Is it you, Rory? Have I got the name right? Wrong. I'll come to that in a second then. Um, we have apologies from Bridger Cluer and Parvis. Um, so I'm now going to go to Nabil to introduce this, please. Well, thank you, Chair, and good morning, um, councillors, colleagues. Happy New Year to, to all of you, and I hope 2023 brings you all um, happiness and prosperity. Now, on to the, the meat of the agenda item. Um, we're here to discuss or to provide you with an update on our two marquee apps programmes, both of which are being funded by the Wiltshire Towns programme. So here we'll be looking at the What's On in Wiltshire programme. We'll also be looking at the Heritage Trails. I'll start briefly with the Heritage Trails. I'll give you a quick update on where we are, then I'll pass over to Victoria and to Terry to go through it with you in more detail in the form of a presentation. But essentially, the Heritage Trail app seeks to share local stories, um, create pathways, create, so essentially facilitate access for both Wiltshire residents and the wider population to come and visit, enjoy, take advantage of what Wiltshire has to offer from a heritage and cultural aspect. It's completely free. It's going to be centered around our town centers, engaging with people and sort of allowing people to really engage with town center history and culture. And we'll go into this in a little bit of detail shortly. The second one, the What's On in Wiltshire app, and this is again funded by the Wiltshire Towns Programme. This is really seeking to create a, a one-stop shop which allows members of the public, both here in Wiltshire and more broadly, to see in one place exactly what's going on across the county. 
It's going to help market not just our marquee assets here in the county, the things we've all heard about, but then some of the lesser known, lesser broadcasted activities we have going on in towns, villages, up and down Wiltshire. And it's something I'm personally excited about. It's the nature of the way people interact with high streets changes, the way people seek to not just identify, but then take advantage of what their communities, their town centres have to offer. A digitally led solution like this, free to use, which is centred around the user, is something which we're really keen to deliver. And it's something I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing in practice. Um, progress is coming on nicely with these. We'll hear a little bit more about how it's looking at the timescales from Victoria and Terry shortly. Um, but I just want to say one, one sort of more overarching point on both of these apps before we pass on. The way people engage with town centres is changing. You know, the way with the sort of the onset of internet, shop, internet shopping, whether it's sort of the pandemic bounce back, whatever it is, if we're going to keep our town centres as vibrant, bustling places where people can come, engage, meet people, interact with the, the lived environment around them, we need to come up with solutions which broadcast our towns as more than just a place to, to buy our food. It has to be an experiential, sort of experience-driven place which pulls people out of their homes and back into the high streets. And I think one of the key ways we're going to do this sort of package within the wider Wiltshire Towns program is by creating these sorts of digital-led solutions which, which close the gap between people and communities. I'm going to pass on to Victoria first, I think, and then Terry to go through some of this with you in more detail. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So we're going to start off with the Heritage Trails app, um, go through a bit about where we got to, why we got there, um, and where we're going on from there. And then we'll move on to the What's On app. So I'll hand over to Terry. Our voice, so I will happily... Okay, I think we're, we're okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, so for those of you who perhaps, perhaps don't know about the regions of the app, um, if I can just give you a brief explanation. Um, it originates from the Salisbury Heritage Trails app that was developed initially in response to the Novichok uh, crisis. And what we wanted to do was try and increase uh, dwell time in the in the city centre because we knew that more people went to the cathedral and the cultural quarter there and didn't dwell in in, in the towns in city centre, um, and we want to increase the number of domestic and international visitors staying in the city centre, and also engage with the local community as well. So we're trying to do two things really. So we want the local community to be able to tell their stories and make use of the app, as well as as, as promoting Salisbury and the heritage of Salisbury to the wider audience. Um, and also, in a way, we'll concentrate on well-being and activities. Well, promote a lot more walking. Now, obviously, during the, 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 the during COVID, we we're unable to sort of promote that as much as we'd like to have done because we were asking people to stay indoors rather than go outside. Um, so, we initially procured Calvium in 2019 um, to to create a content management backed. Uh, location aware app which enables us to add content add trails as we would like uh, and manipulate the routes um, and they delivered that for us in 2020 um, because covid uh, and the pandemic kicked in we were unable to launch it properly um, we had a soft launch in december 2020 uh, and we're really doing that around experience Salisbury as well and tying in with their promotions uh, 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 and, and, and trying to get some engagement that way um, once we've done that, we've been able to focus on how we might want to move forward with the Salisbury app, but equally we had, uh, 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 I suppose, a request to deliver a more Wiltshire-wide app. Um, and the key procurement request initially from the Salisbury app was that we should develop, develop an app that could be cloned for use of other towns and could also be developed for other towns. So it was always in mind that this app wouldn't just be for Salisbury. Now, during our investigations, we, we learned one or two things about how Salisbury app was being used and what we need to do to improve that app. Um, but we also were looking at, um, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, other towns as well and what they were doing. So some of the key lessons we were learning was that um, in terms of the Salisbury app, we, we were looking at, we, we felt we, the feedback we got was we need more storytelling, need to be a bit more energetic, more engaging. Um, 
we need to make it a bit less scrambled in terms of the interface and things like that. So there's quite a lot of streamlining we could do and just improve the overall, I suppose, the overall, I suppose, engagement of the app, uh, of the app uh, make it a bit more, I suppose, engaging to the public. Um, it was a very well, the information was very good, it's very good content, but just that, that bit of engagement we felt. We did look at how some other apps were working, whether there had been an alternative model to Calvium. Um, we looked at the Malmesbury Town Council and what they were doing with their app. They've got a web-based app. Um, the cost of that web-based app, though, is a minimum £10,000 per town. Um, it's work, they work with Winchester University, and the content is delivered, but it doesn't give any flexibility. What you see, effectively, is what you get. Um, and so to be a folk for the local community to be able to add, although they can add material to it, it wasn't very straightforward. Um, we also looked at a very cheap end, I suppose you could say, a caution model. Um, they have PDFs on the website you can download. Now that's fine, that works quite well. If, uh, if you're able to download a PDF and use that as, with your phone and you're able to enlarge it and view it. It's not location aware though, so it doesn't indicate where you are on the map. It doesn't doesn't uh, alert you to any interesting stories as you're going past um, and it's quite a basic thing and you probably need to, to really zoom up and zoom down it's quite an awkward uh, uh, app to, 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 to use so those are the kind of things we looked at so uh, we I, I suppose the other things that came out for us were that we didn't have enough audio visual content the Calvia map enables us to put both film and video on as well um, and the other issue we, 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 we found is that we kind of we realised that there were apps out there already, but we didn't want to duplicate them either. So we took that Marlesbury and Caution, but you've got small villages like Bronham have their own little town trail on, on, on the web. So we feel that we'd probably better off directing those more to customers on our, on our apps, on our, using our, our app to those smaller apps as well, so rather than duplicate, which will come clear when we talk about the towns that we're going to focus on initially. Um, Victoria, do you have anything to add to that at the moment? Nothing to add, so just so much to kind of explain from an economic perspective um, some of the details behind what Terry said. When we look at dwell time, you know, we know we've got Bath just on our border and a lot of our experience shows that coach trips and tour trips do a quick stop in Wiltshire at one of our assets, be it the Cathedral or Stonehenge, and then they head on up. And if they're there for half an hour, they consider that fine and adequate. And what we really wanted to do was increase the free provision in the city so that people had things to do that would encourage a longer stay. So, you know, really looking to not just a quick trip to the cathedral or a quick trip to the close, but actually coming into the town centre where in Salisbury they've got a 12th century doom painting, uh, which shows a local landlady rumoured to have watered down her beer being cast into hell by her parishioners. You know, it, it is about that local colour. It's about the moon rakers in devices. It's about all those kind of lovely stories that we tell but we don't really tell outsiders. So I think for us, it really is around that free encouragement to linger on the high street, adding that local colour, adding those local characters. Okay, um, so the current procurement, um, we're, we're the Heritage Service is working with economy and, economy and regeneration um, to develop a Wiltshire-wide app now. Um, and in terms of procurement, we received an exemption uh, so that we're able to go directly and work with Calvin, continue our work with Calvin. We thought that offered best value for money as we'd already invested in the app um, and they were aware of our needs. And most importantly, they're able to develop a content management system backed app, which very few uh, providers can, 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 other app providers can achieve. The idea is that each town will have a discrete landing page or, or a discrete space. So in addition to ourselves and Wiltshire Council adding trails, it's also a potential for local communities to add trails, town councils to add their own trails as well. We could particularly add temporary trails, so seasonal trails could be added if we're wanting a marketing promotion, say, whether that's at Christmas or whether you're running a literary festival or a summer festival, you can add your trails on, on, on that way. Um, to do that, though, we need to change the Salisbury apps. We have to change Salisbury app to a Wiltshire app, and that's where a cost involved. It costs us £12,000 to make that change. And then 
we're making one thousand. We're, 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 it all going to cost one thousand pounds per town to add each each each, each area. Um, so we think that is much preferable to the monetary model, which was which is vastly more more, more expensive. Um, so we will add. 10 trails ourselves for one for 10 trails. We've selected 10 towns and we want to add a trail for each town just to kickstart it so we can demonstrate what, what, what it looks like. You can see the trails up uh, listed up there at the moment. And we've got a heritage services team are working on those ones. We've just selected some from around the county and where we know the town councils are very keen to start pushing on with this app. Um, what we will be doing is delivering workshops with the town councils to introduce the app. And hopefully we can then encourage more town councils to participate. Um, Victoria will probably talk about that in, in, in a bit. Um, um, and we'll work very much with local communities to add trails uh, 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 from our heritage team uh, and, and to use our archives, our, our resources, our local museum resources, um, and also the local stories. We're gonna train volunteers to upload and, uh, their own trails. Uh, and town council had the content as well. We'll be adding video and audio as well. We've got an extensive oral history collection at the History Centre, uh, which we can clip. And we've also got access to old cine film, which we're hoping to add as well. Uh, we work with a company called Windrose who, 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 who digitise our, our cine film and we're able to take clips from them. Um, as Victoria said, we're hoping to work with a, a, a histor notable historian to have a media profile. Again, we felt that we needed that extra engagement, and, and the way of doing that is, is, is to have someone fairly well known introducing the app, um, and, and that's something we are working on. We do have contacts, as you'd imagine, within the heritage sector uh, of, of those historians. Um, and we're looking to get some content. We've got colleagues working on the content at the moment, um, and we hope to put some content up for Easter and hopefully there'll be something for us to demonstrate then. Yeah, just to add a little bit to what Terry was saying. So this is very much our first tranche of town. Um, we, Calvium informed us that in their capacity, they had the space to add 10. Uh, so we were limited. We've got 22 towns and we've got 10 spaces. Um, so where we've made those decisions, um, these are actually towns that are doing reasonably well, um, or are large towns. So, you know, Devizes, Bradford on Avon, these are lovely towns that are doing pretty well. The towns that are missing are the towns that are likely to have more intense work done with them through the towns program. So we're currently engaged quite heavily with Westbury. We're moving on to Melksham. You know, we know with some of the sites around Melksham that there is gonna be quite a large shift in their town center. And then we'll move on from there to Amesbury and Calm. But we do intend to add those towns just at a later date. Um, so it was never an easy decision, but, you know, there is a logic behind the towns that are included and the towns that aren't at this stage. First tranche, we will get to them. I'll quickly move on to the What's On In Wiltshire app. So this is a complementary app to the Wiltshire Towns programme, which seeks to list events across Wiltshire in a way that's not unique to one town or one place. I don't know about you, but when I'm looking for an event, for the weekend in Wiltshire, where am I going to take my friends? I have to scour enumerate Facebook pages, enumerate town pages, and it, it really is the sense that for our rural residents and residents in villages, there is no one place to look. And equally for people in towns, they may not want to stick to the one town that they're in. Um, so at the moment, our event provision is either targeted at people external to Wiltshire, visit Wiltshire, or it's targeted at individual areas. So we have Experience Salisbury, we have you know, what's on pages and Trowbridge and devices, or it's social media marketing. It is very much that town council's Facebook page or the town's Facebook page. And it's really bad for searchable facilities. You know, do you know if there are toilets? Do you know if it's free? Do you know if it's kid-friendly? Do you know if it's a history event? There is no searchable filter. So we think that there's a real gap here in terms of what we can provide. We think that there are lots of really great events in Wiltshire. And one of the things that we think is really important is that these are quality events. So they're not your regular village hall yoga sessions. They're not your regular kind of every Thursday there's a lunch and learn at the library. You know, these are going to be your special offerings, your quality offerings, things that people would travel for and would probably pay for. 
We then looked at what can the market offer? So what are other people doing in terms of advertising these events? And most of these offerings are retail based. So we've got a kind of joke in our team that it's always, you know, 15% off cost of coffee. That's what you see when you open the app. And then you search through six different adverts and then you change the view and then you might get to the events. And actually the events are the priority for people. We know that high streets are going to become experience led. We know that it's all about events. So we need to make them front and centre. So this has led us to some conclusions in terms of this development, which is ongoing. The first is that a web app, which is both an app and a website, will work best. It's searchable. You, most people, if they want to know what's on at that weekend, they'll go to Google and they'll say, what's on in my town this weekend? And so we need something that has search engine optimization. We'll, function on func we'll focus on functionality. Um, while retaining its usability on a mobile device. We will need to curate the content, so there will be an automatic upload system for trusted event delivery. So, for example, there's no point somebody at Longley adding every single one of their events to our events app. That would not be a good use of time. So there's an automation facility that says, this person is trusted to put on good events, and they can just be automatically uploaded from their own feed. So that reduces the resourcing. Um, but we also need to have space for one-off events for you know, people that we don't know about to add things and be added to the app. We would like a content tagging system that does tell you things like, are there bathrooms? Is it child-friendly? What sort of event is it? Is it music? Is it comedy? Is it history? And we want it to be attract attractive and exciting. This is a marketing device. It is about marketing our town centres and Wiltshire as a destination. So it needs to demonstrate that and it needs to be attractive. And it does need to be bespoke. It needs to integrate with our existing systems. One of the things we have learned from Calvium and the reason that we talk so much about the content management system is that that allows any of us to log into the app and change what's there if we don't like it or if it's not working. And what we've learned in the last three years is whatever you think is going to happen is not going to happen, what's going to happen. So we know that we need a system that's flexible, that we can work with and we can change. And so that means it does have to integrate very well with our own systems. So we're able to change it and that's it right thank you for that before i open to questions just um a query as you talk about developing towns and getting the first 10 up um there's some little areas like avery and silbury hill west kennet long barrow and wilton windmill they're sort of like touristy sort of things would they could they be added into the, perhaps the marlborough area rather than being their own individual set pages or um, and there's a, i know there's a wealth of places in wiltshire that are small places but got very historical things whether they would come under the the main hub area or the area board area or which way you want I, to develop that. I think that would be the plan. I think the advice from Calvium is to not overload the number of places you have on an app for because of the way in which people search. So you're quite correct that if we were delivering something for A you want to put a trail up for Avebury, we would probably put it under a Marlborough or a Khan area or something like that. Yeah. Right, so I'll open to questions, and the first hand I got, and I'll come to you later. Tell is Brian Matthew, and I'll take you first, and then I'll take you, Bill, and I'll come round. Thank you very much, uh, um, as the Environment Select Committee, we're a scrutiny committee, and I have to say that some serious scrutiny is required here. Um, the Heritage Trail apps and the Wiltshire Town app are part of the one million pound support for Wiltshire Wiltshire's market towns announced at full council. Uh, at the finance session on February the 15th, 2022. So they're not free to use. They, they're, they're costing Wiltshire council taxpayers a great deal of money. Um, at last year's full council meeting, the Lib Dems argued that the money should instead have been spent on continued free Sunday parking and continued free parking for blue badge holders for every day of the week. And the loss of this amenity has drawn much criticism across our county. I, for one, have heard it, and I warrant that most of the members ha here have also. Um, I would like to know how much uh, has been spent to date uh, on the website development, how much is expected to be spent in total, uh, what the expected returns are for forecasted to be, um, whether there has been any attempt to link with Visit Wiltshire .co.uk. Uh, and fourthly, given that Wiltshire already has a website for its towns called visitwiltshire.co.uk, which is paid for by the various town council tourist information centres, um, can the Wiltshire 
Council version being discussed today be described as an unneeded and unwarranted vanity project that's actually damaging to Wiltshire's market towns because by the use of our scant funds raised from the residents of Wiltshire's council tax in this profligate way, it is discouraging residents and outsiders from visiting due to the parking charges which have seemingly been brought in to pay for it. And lastly, has there been any attempt to evaluate the effect of the increased parking charges on our market towns and the shops? Uh, and has there been decreased footfall and sales as a result? As the scrutiny committee for this item, I believe we should be told. Thank you. Very clever political work there, Mr. Matthew. Um, to say that car parking charges, I don't want to go into this, 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 this development and that, but some I'm paying car parking charges in Bath, Bournemouth, Southampton, where I've been recently in Reading, and we're, we're paying them all, all across the county. Yes, on a Sunday in Bournemouth, I know, so anyway, but I don't want to get into the political side of this. This is an app that's been developed. It was passed at Wiltshire Care at the, at the budget last year. It was, was approved, so we are going with the way we are. Um, if there's any questions there you can answer, I will allow you to answer them. I'm happy to go first, Chair, if you, if you want, just to, to, to pick at the, at the crux of that highly politically motivated question. Um, Let's, let's look at this idea of, and, and as we've already heard from the chair, car parking charges are something which is becoming an unfortunate net sort of necessity in life. It's something we're seeing going up across the board. And I would add that I think in Wiltshire, our car parking charges remain lower than in sort of major competitors in, in neighboring counties. But there's a bigger question, which is fundamentally, if the town centers don't have anything to offer, and it's not an offering that the public know about, how much you're charging for parking is irrelevant because people aren't going to come into our town councils. That's why I think the importance of a marketing tool like this, which actually articulates the offering, coupled with an effective communications and outreach campaign, which takes that offering to the public, not just here in Wiltshire, but more sort of across the, the Southwest and more broad, sort of more broadly than that, will, will more than compensate for that. And it goes back to that point I made at the beginning around how the, the nature of how people interact with their towns is changing and the nature in which we need to promote our towns has to subsequently change. So I see this as an investment in supporting that transformation and in allowing not just our town councils but the businesses who operate within them to to thrive and as part of my work on this on this project i've engaged with a number of our our key stakeholders whether it's our strategic art partners our heritage partners the private sector and a range of other entities and this has been welcomed almost wholeheartedly and it's through that engagement we've been able to identify a series of things which we've we've built into this project at an early stage things like automation which will actually save people money and time and in return, yield returns through, through increased visitor numbers. It's something we've thought through very carefully. It's something I have confidence in. And it's something I think we need to do. And I think to, to conflate uh, what I, I personally feel is a politically motivated motion at full council almost a year ago with a potentially transformational project like this, I think is a, is a false causal link. And I'll, I'll leave my comments there for now. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. I'll let you come back, Brian, but I don't want to go back to the um, car parking. Well, the, I, I, I won't mention that if you don't want me to, but I do want to say that we do already have visit wiltshire.co.uk. Why is there need for this? I really, it's like reinventing the wheel. Victoria, you can answer that. Yes. So we've obviously spoken to the town councils that are members of Visit Wiltshire, and we've spoken to Visit Wiltshire themselves, and we are aware that there is some overlap. But if if Visit Wiltshire was providing everything, then the town councils wouldn't have their own pages, and a lot of them do. Um, so Experience Salisbury was set up because Salisbury felt that they needed more local provision. Visit Wiltshire is targeted at bringing people from outside Wiltshire into Wiltshire. What we know is that within Wiltshire, there are a lot of people who have weekend plans or would like to make weekend plans, but they are within Wiltshire, so they're not going to go and look at a tourism website. So they need a provision that's kind of internal, that looks between the different towns. What I would also say is the functionality of that website is not ideal, and also that you have to be a member to advertise your event. So those are two kind of exclusionary factors that we know are a challenge for some of our communities, um, and we have been engaging on this topic for probably about 18 months, and we know that the demand is there. So it, there is duplication, but it may be necessary duplication, and there's areas in which it does not duplicate. Thank you, Victoria. Um, Councillor Parks. 
Thank you, um, Chair. Um, if I may perhaps go down into a, a little more detail, thank officers for the presentation. The Heritage Trail app, uh, you, you said in there in order to develop it, you have engaged with a number of the uh, towns, Salisbury, Mulberry, and Horsham. But I'm aware within many of our market towns, we've got like the blue plaque uh -huh. trails and buildings of significant interest. I'm just wondering, have you, are you able to incorporate, is it the intention to incorporate that? That's my first question. My second question is, I think you mentioned that you would allow the towns and others to upload stuff. I'm just a little bit worried that that may well be open to abuse, if you like, if, if that you don't manage who's uploading to that app. So perhaps you can give me some reassurance on that, please. Thank you. Yes, so firstly, we would seek to include all local assets, um, but we do intend to be guided by the local community, by the town council, in terms of what is actually involved in the trail. I think we have so many heritage assets, we're probably not going to be able to fit them all on one trail. So there will be a level of curation, but it's our intention to work jointly with the local community to work out what's most important to them. Um, on your second question about uploading to the app, of course it wouldn't be a free upload. We would be expecting an MOU, a memorandum of understanding between the parties about who's allowed to upload and the kind of content policies that we have. And what we're working through at the moment is Calvium's position on that because obviously we're their customer um, so how do they feel about other people uploading does it have to be through us can it be independently so we just have to work through how that looks for them but we certainly wouldn't be allowing just anyone to upload anything they like yeah thank you thank you for that if I may chair so the intention would be you would there would be some measure of control in uploading and one would hope that that would predominantly be managed, not predominantly, but managed through the town councils or the, or the market towns. Yes, we've been working with the town council. So the conversations we've had have been through the action plan development under the town's programme. Um, so they're kind of aware that we will be coming to them with the workshops. Um, and yeah, very much they will be our key point of contact. Sorry, Terry. I was just going to add that um, the, the element of moderation is inbuilt in the content management system with, um, if you're familiar with websites of users and super users and editors and heritage services will always maintain the control as a super user. So we'll ultimately have the, make the decision if something goes on or not. Councillor Jackson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Well, it's working, lovely. Um, a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm sorry it's taken us so long to get this far. Delighted to see that Warminster, which I've been promoting for some time as a um, leading candidate, uh, is included in your list. Uh, I've got a number of questions, if I may, Chair. Firstly, who owns the website? Or rather, who owns the app? In fact, there are now, I see there are now two apps. So who owns the apps? Who is the editor? Who has editorial responsibility? And how are we going to be able to integrate not only town councils, but also um, local businesses and other local interests into the app so that the local businesses can promote themselves? Thank you very much. So we are the owner for the apps and we are the editor. Um, so we maintain that control that the end of the project, the app is handed over. So the end of the development, Calvium will hand the app over to us. The web app will be hosted by us. So we will maintain that level of control. Um, we've seen with other websites where we've shared it, it hasn't been so clear and that is a, a lesson well learned. Um, in terms of integrating with businesses and with town councils, it's very bespoke to the local area. So it depends entirely on who you speak to with devices. They've got devices indies who are really, really active, who do a lot of social media promotion. So we'd need to include them. With Salisbury, they've got Experience Salisbury, which is a group set up to manage with Salisbury Indies represented. So we'd need to work with them. So 
while I can't give you a set answer, we definitely will be working with each local community about how the app is used and engaged with. Um, our business representation is really important to us in within the overarching towns programme, um, but how we get it differs in each place. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just one final question. Is there a dummy we can look at now? The Salisbury app is still up at the moment. Councillor Wallace. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So I'll start by saying I'm, I'm a huge fan of this. I think this is exactly what we need to be doing. Uh, having spent many years yeah. lobbying on behalf of small businesses, I can tell you that free parking is not the magic bullet that some people think it is. This is what brings people in and, and free parking is not free. It is paid for by the taxpayer just as this is paid for by the taxpayer. Um, so I think this is exactly the route we need to go down. Um, I've actually got three questions, if I may, two on the Heritage app and one on the What's On app. Um, on the Heritage app, when this was mentioned at a previous meeting of this committee, I think I asked a question about working with the uh, local community to develop it. And when I saw this in my agenda, I spoke to the town clerk and devisers and said, do you know about this? And he said, I have no idea about it at all. So he has not been approached or doesn't believe he's been approached. So I just wanted some reassurance on that that you will be working closely because in devices you have devices indies are a small group working on one thing but we also have the trust for devices who have a heritage app already well heritage trail already we have a lot of different blue plaques and trails around the town so it's really important that you work there so i'd like some reassurance on that that that's what you intend to do second question on the heritage app is how you're going to promote it um, and obviously that's going to be more useful. Some local residents will use it, but it's going to be more useful for visitors. So have you considered things like QR codes in car parks, promotions around where people are going to be landing in the town? And the third question is on the what's on app. So outside of being a councillor, I have a, a very large community Facebook group for, for devices. And we have a lot of events and things advertised on there. It's probably the main place where people do get information on events. And I found that actually what makes it valuable to the town is having everything advertised and having a lot of things, particularly all the live music in the pubs and all the different events. And I can imagine that some of those people might not be regarded immediately as trusted partners to, to upload those things. So I just wanted a bit more detail on how you're going to choose those trusted partners and how often that list is going to be updated. Thank you. Just so in terms of town conversations with town councils, we've been having them on submission of the action plan and we haven't had the devices action plan at this time. So we are still waiting that, but the team is in touch and engaged and we know that devices kind of will know what they're doing as soon as they submit the plan. So we don't have any concerns there, but that's just why we haven't had the conversation at this time. Um, jumping to the bit about what's on and then I'll hand back for, to Terry for the app. Um, there will be two routes to upload. So if you are a trusted partner, it will be automated from your website or your feed to the web app. If you are unknown to us, if this is the first event that you put on, it will be a kind of submission form. Um, so there will be two routes. Um, but if we see that you're uploading, you know, five events a month, we're not expecting any particular kind of structure to become a trusted partner. So, you know, if somebody is doing that work, we would expect to engage with them and work out the best way for them to be giving us that information. So we don't have any kind of rules about who's trusted and who isn't. But if it is a one off or if it's somebody that doesn't do this very often, there would be a submission route as well. Sorry, and your middle question. Yeah, the, the middle question was about the promotion of the Heritage app in particular, but I suppose both apps, but particularly Heritage because it's more focused on people who may not be living here and consuming our social media and website all the time. Yeah, so part of the um, promotion of the Heritage apps is, as Terry said, we're working with local notable historians um, with social media followings who may be able to engage a wider audience for us. People don't naturally look to, town, to Wiltshire Council for fun things in town centres or heritage, um, even though I think they should. Uh, so it is very much around, you know, where is that audience? How do we get to them? But within the budgets for these apps, 
we have included marketing provision because we know we will need to undertake it and we know that it will need to be quite long term um, across both Heritage and What's On. It's one thing to launch. It's another thing to remind people this is the platform. This is where you can find out what's happening. So we know that that will be needed. Um, and that is a consideration as part of the town's program. So just to come back briefly on that, I do think that having physical places where people can come across this is really important. So particularly in car parks, if people are going to be arriving for the first time, having something there, telling them about that will be important. And in devices we have, what I refer to as the obelisks, I really don't like them, the, the wayfinding map things that we have there, but having something there um, that people are physically going to see, because I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of social media and I do think that pushing information out that way is really important, but actually, particularly in devices where people are coming for Wiltshire Museum and, and um, other attractions, that they are more likely to observe something that they're seeing in front of them rather than going on and um, looking at social media first. Absolutely, and we will be aiming to have physical presence, perhaps some printed maps to do with the launch, locations that people are reminded that the app exists, um, all of those things. We have looked at QR codes, um, and the feedback that we had at the time was that QR is not a native technology to Android phones. So you have to download a QR reader, and if we're looking at some of our expected audience, you know, is that a step that they're going to go through? They're not just downloading one app, they're downloading two. Um, so we are kind of aware of that, and we know that we'll need to hit multiple channels, um, which we are looking at as part of the programme. Councillor Walters. Um, uh, very interesting presentation. Um, could I just ask you about the um, dependency that we have on um, Calvium, did you call it? And um, what sort of platform you're operating on? You know, do we have any uh, vulnerability to, uh, say, for example, Calvium going down the tubes or the underlying technology no longer being supported? So that's something that Calvium are very aware of. Um, we have long conversations with them about Apple App Store additions and you know when things are supported and when they're not. So they do give us the heads up when changes are required and we've made provision for those changes being required with them. With them as themselves, um, the CMS system, the content management system sits with us as do the, does the app platform. So once it's published, it exists. Um, one of the things that I'm really keen to do is to make sure that it doesn't exist beyond the lifetime of it being supported or needed. So that's another conversation we've had. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that sometimes you go and look at something and it's clear it's been left for 10 years. Um, and I don't want us to be in that position. I want us to be offering a professional, well-marketed service that attracts people. So we've had those kind of conditions about conversations about what happens if this goes wrong, what happens if this goes wrong. But on the principle, once the app is published, we will hold the CMS system and there will be no risk there. Sorry, can I, can, I, can I just add? Um, so with regards to the content management system, the, I, the beauty is with the content management system is that we already have the content that we can just preload and load onto any other content management system. So we're not necessarily relying on a specific content management system should anything happen to Calvium. Now, what we do think is that Calvium is quite a robust company. It's well established in the app field, has been for many years. Uh, it works around the whole of the country particularly in the City of London, for example, it drives all the City of London apps, uh, Heritage Trail apps as well. So we think we are confident they'll still be around, but, but it's transportable. So everything we put on, we own and we have, and we can just transport it to another content management system. Okay, so there's no need for an escrow agreement or anything like that? Not as far as we've been advised by our procurement colleagues. Councillor McClellan. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, convoluted. There is a question at the end of all this. One of my favourite museums is in Glasgow, the People's Palace. And if I wander around there, I can press a button, read a bit of information, uh, or hear a piece of information, or see a piece of information. And part of it is the local people telling, yeah, this is the building and this is the history of the building, one thing. Yeah, I was in there and I did this and, you know, like the dance halls and going do the wacko and all that sort of stuff. So are you saying this app can do that? 
So if, if I passed a building, should we say, um, would I be able in some way from the app or, or it will just, you know, having downloaded the app and I'm wandering around, will it automatically happen? Or will I say, oh, there's number seven, number seven, and it will do all those things or, or offer all those options for me. That's the one thing. The other um, similar thing, uh, I went around a historic site in Paphos recently. And as you want, you downloaded the app before you went into the big open space. Uh, and it took you around the various bibs and bobs and explained what all these stones were and pillars and the rest of it, which brought them to life a bit more. And then very in great detail explained all of the mosaics there and what they all represented and what was in them all and, and the stories behind them. So is all this combined in your app? And if so, how I mean, it's a sort of monumental task to get, you know, as I pass by a street in Salisbury and there's like 20 buildings, all of huge significance, which nobody knows about. Um, how do we get all of that information on and going? And how do we collect the local voices? How do we collect the local film and, and put it in, in, in a reasonable way? And, you know, are we relying on other people to help with that? And finally, sorry, it's a long story. I just say there was questions in it. My village is Laverstock. My parish is Laverstock and Ford. We are literally wrapped around Salisbury. We've got lots of country walks and trails and community farms and stuff. So I think from what you've answered in other questions that we will be linked into Salisbury in some way. And therefore we've got historians in Laverstock. Um, how would we interact to get our stuff in? And that's okay, but if I go first and go through some of the, yeah, so absolutely share your passion for getting local voices onto the app. That's something we want to do. I think it really enhances the stories. Uh, that's something we will do. It's something that Heritage Services does anyway. We, we are very good at engaging local communities. We run oral history projects. We run a whole range of projects in a range of areas, diverse areas, deprived areas, and in, 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 uh, and with, whole, uh, with all ages as well. So we're very good at engaging people in the local community. So I think we will be able to tease that content out. I think we're very confident of that. It'll take some time. It's only why we're developing 10 towns, only doing one trial per town, because obviously it takes a considerable amount of time. But once we get it up and running, establish the principle, we can build on that daily. Um, so I think that will be something which we, we can do. In terms of the way the location where our app works, you're right, it will alert you when you walk past a building. What we haven't done in this occasion, which we, we have done in the past in villages, I should have mentioned many years ago, we developed a, an app for Laycock uh, with Calvium. Uh, and that did, as soon as you walk past the building, it started talking to you. Um, the thing is that if you're in an urban area or a busy area, you won't necessarily hear that so easily. So what we've done is you will get an alert and then you will press a button to start hearing, either hearing the audio, choose hearing the audio or not, and the information will come up. The information will alert you. So as soon as you walk past the building, we can, we can narrow it down to about 12, 10, 12 metres, if even narrower than that. So in an urban area, that's quite important. On a rural area, obviously not, not so needed because, because obviously you, you, you've got less interference, less... Less, less buildings to confuse you if you're standing in front of two buildings. Um, so, yeah, so we can do all of these things. And so we will be working on developing that. I don't know if I've covered all your questions there. Yeah, so given, given we've got local historians in, in my parish, um, how, how would we interact to get into the Salisbury bibs and bobs? And if you're walking along a nature trail, how do, how do they alert you? What, what was the mechanism for that at various points? So we will be starting off with the towns um, and we'll be starting off with one trail. So I think it would be some time before we widened it out because um, obviously we've got a lot of towns to add. But, you know, if um, you want to put your local historians in touch with us we've got a wiltshire towns program email address and we can you know have that conversation and make sure it is very much 
you know, we're keen to work where people are interested in working with us. So as much as we're saying we're going to do a town, we're going to do a trail, we'd like to hear what the kind of options are. In terms of the out and about um, nature trails, I think it depends on the landmarks and whether or not there are enough landmarks to make it a trail or is it just a walk. Um, there are other provision out there, there is other provision out there on the market for trails um, that are kind of, you know, dog walks or walking up onto the plane or anything like that. So I think it would depend on, you know, is it, is that trail a story that the community needs to tell, you know, and does it have enough landmarks that we could reasonably direct a visitor around it? Um, the further you go outside of the town centres, the more reliant on GPS we are. So one of the things we've done with Calvium, in fact, we didn't mention it, but one of the earlier stages is really, really looking at how reliable the app is across Wiltshire, because you know we don't have constant signal, we don't have constant 4G. What happens when those signals dip? Um, and so the reason that we went with Calvium is it is GPS based. So in theory, we should be able to add those nature trails, but we would want to check that we've got enough content to be talking about rather than just a line on a map. Thank you for that. Um, talking about being parochial, I thought we were talking about Wiltshire. When you went to Pathos, you completely threw me. <laughs> you completely and utterly threw me off any nature trail, any trail in Wiltshire. You threw me, so be careful. Councillor Jacob. Thank you. Um, I just had two sort of think things that you made me think about. One was the users, um, and obviously there are. You're anticipating different kinds of users. So you've got the tourist and the resident as the two main groups. But I wondered how much you were thinking within those groups. So whether you're thinking about children, young people, retired, you know, dog walkers or whatever those kind of people are and how you anticipate them using it. So it's, it's not really, I suppose it's not a question, but it's just how have you considered that? And, and presumably that links into the way you're promoting it. So that was the first bit. And, and, and also how are you going to measure success in terms of, how you're reaching those different groups, because thinking about your celebrity historians, obviously there's opportunities to get young people involved, maybe in a more funky way than some of the older ones of us. And the second part was a really bit of a boring bit, was it seems like a huge amount of work. And in terms of your long-term plan, I don't know whether it's going to take you 10 years to get everything, you know, to get it all up and running, whether this is an additional post or is it somebody particularly managing it or whether it's a job that's being absorbed by someone who already exists yeah so in terms of marketing um the thing that we're looking at is as opposed to a resident or visitor is catchment area so who reasonably could be expected to visit wiltshire and broadly that goes 90 minutes um that's what people consider for a weekend trip maybe two hours in the southwest the national average is around 90 minutes so we kind of look at that catchment area um, our target market tends to be around 55, usually with a family, um, with discretionary spend uh, because it's a high street programme. So that's what I'm looking at. Um, but like you say, um, there are different groups that we can target. And if your kids were really interested in something for a weekend, you probably would go and do it. So we need to make sure that we are kind of hitting. And alongside the economic principles that I sit behind, Terry's principles are very different and are around engagement and education. So we kind of balancing those um, and we'll try different things and it's why we think that long-term marketing is so important because actually we'll need to kind of refresh the offer and change the different groups you know if we put the nutcracker trail from Salisbury up over a winter well we're going to want to hit this group if we put kind of the history of orchestral music we're going to want to hit quite a different group so it is about you know that flexibility and making sure we've got that long term in terms of capacity um one of the things when we brought the wider towns program to this committee capacity was the challenge and i think it was very fair um so what we have done is we've um increased a post an existing post um to deliver the work alongside what we're doing with calvium and the existing assets terry i don't know if you had anything to no, I was going to say, in terms of capacity, you're right, we've, we've been able to add some existing capacity to our, our staffing, but also as part of a, a, a review of, of, of the heritage services, we actually changed the post of our heritage education officers, now our heritage uh, education and digital engagement officer uh, with additional hours uh, in, in that particular post. And so we, we, we hopefully we've got some of that covered. Okay, um, Councillor Trotman, you've been waiting, and I'm going to let you 
Oh, as is New Year, Tony, uh, Mr. Jackson, I'll let you come back on the one. Councillor Trotman. Yeah, that's it. Um, yes, thank you, Jerry, uh, Chairman, um, for allowing me to speak. It, it's an incredibly exciting um, idea that we have here. Um, I'm not sure that you know, but obviously Khan Heritage Centre um, has been run since 2004. Uh, we wrested the Carnegie Building from Wiltshire Council. <laughs> it cost our taxpayers quite a lot of money, but we won a, um, a lottery bid and we kitted it out. And I, I, I'm the chairman of the trustees and have been for, um, since its inception. Uh, we, we use the Heritage Centre um, to boost economy in our town. That's exactly what we do. We get 3,000 visitors a year. And those visitors come from not, not only our town but, um, and the Wiltshire towns, but the wider towns right through England. And we get a lot of European people um, from Scandinavia, um, and obviously American, Japanese, Chinese people come to our town. And it's mostly because of the uh, gateway to the Downlands, you know, with the Avebury, Laycock um, area and the North Wessex Downs, of course, which are very attractive. Um, but we've used Visit Wiltshire, we've used the Great West Way. And to be quite honest with you, we've ditched all of those because we do our own thing. And we've got expertise um, that do audio, um, tape runs, uh, we, we've done um, heritage trails, we, we've got a heritage um, trail which we plaque right through the town. Uh, we have blue plaque trails, we've now got a new art trail. Mm -hmm. So why I'm here today, I suppose, I was looking at the um, agenda and found this particular item on it and was rather worried that Carl isn't on it. Um, and what I suppose my question is, what, why aren't you using the smaller towns like Carn that seems to be, you know, in the in the distance of in Wiltshire, rather than the larger towns that, that have a, a footfall great, greater than ourselves? We, we, we do this especially to try and sort of attract the economy. And obviously, our town has a, a free two-hour <laughs> car parking, which, as you well know, the taxpayers pay for. But that free two hours gives us just that impetus right on the Heritage Quarter car park uh, to actually visit the town. We have uh, 20, 25 volunteer stewards. We run on fresh air. We, we get a grant from Carn Town Council, which covers our utilities, but we do everything ourselves. And I think this particular app that I see here is really exciting. We really want to get to grips with it, but it looks as though we're right at the back of the queue again. But, you know, our... I, I think most towns that have got either a heritage centre or not a museum, you know, because we don't have museum status, we don't get any help, we don't get any help from Wiltshire Council as such, to actually see this, we would honestly really be um, a, attracted to. And I just hope that what you've said today uh, would actually work. Um, there's an initial cost of £1,000 per town. Is Will this be such you know will you be asking those towns to actually be part of it and if so can we be part of it you know we're, we're incredibly excited about how these things work and our new town clerk our, our town councillors certainly don't know anything about this app but i didn't know anything about it until about three days ago and i must admit we've not <clears throat> been out and about through sort of viruses and illnesses but we um, sat there reading it I, you know i had to come along today just to explain exactly what we do you know, because obviously, like, like others, we've got we've had Wordsworth, we've got Coleridge, we've got Priestley, and we've got a huge amount of people that actually come just for those reasons. So please don't leave us out. And um, I would be willing to sort of put our ideas to yours as, as well as yours to us. So there's no real question. It's just I'm excited about this and I want to be part of it. I mean, picking the towns for the 10 spaces we had, so ah. as much as it's the town for Hanford Town, it's the fact that Calvium can add 10 spaces at this time with their capacity is what limited us. Um, and it was difficult. Um, we said to the towns to give us three adjectives 
Um, and we said we don't want historic and nearly every single town has come back with historic. A couple have come back with ancient, which I think is a nice Nice play on that, um, but we will accept ancient. So, you know, we know we've got... <laughs> Traditional original, I think, is uh, their key line. Um, but, you know, we've got, we've, we know we've got this volume of heritage assets and we are really keen to not leave anyone out. So I think what we can look to do is try and create that link in the interim um, so that we don't leave you out and maybe we can have a discussion around how we do that. Um, but... If anyone is less than enthusiastic than Carl about being included, you will be first on our list. Could I, could I just say that um, we, we have data of the people who visit us, because um, obviously we have a, a visitor book. Not everybody fills it out, but we have gained data, you know, um, and the ages and the groups. Uh, we entertain schools, of course, because we want our own children to be proud of our town. Um, all, all of that seems to be, you know, would, would come into it. But I think it's the economy. We, we have just, I'm very unfortunate in the last few days, had three shops are closing. We've been very fortunate uh, that, those, that all of our shops have been filled. But suddenly now with the economy just is collapsing even more, um, we, we need to boost our economy even more. And by using the Wiltshire app, uh, or this particular one, um, I think, you know, is absolutely vital, you know, for all of us smaller towns that are re really struggling. Thank you. No, Bill. Could I, could I just add briefly? Um, yeah, Heritage Service work, has worked quite a lot with the uh, Khan Heritage Centre and we'd be delighted to continue to work with them. We've worked on some, I think we've actually led some walking tours around the town for, for you, so we're very keen to continue that. And yeah, uh, if, you, if you'd like to contact me, certainly we'll, 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 we'll look at how we can perhaps build in, get you thinking about the content and how you, what you might want to do in the future. Just briefly, slightly aside from this, you mentioned you didn't get any support from Wiltshire Council in terms of the Heritage Centre. Hopefully our Conservation Museum Advisory Service is working with you, alongside you, to support you. If they're not, then please do get in contact. I think they are, but if, but if they're not, if, we, if I've misunderstood, then please get in contact. Because they, they do, we do actually, while we may not be able to provide cash support, we can provide a lot of expertise for you. Uh, Tony, I, I can't let you go on again because... <laughs> Everyone gets two bites to cherry here. Otherwise, we're going to we've been an hour on this um, thing, and uh, and uh, good luck and talk to the officers thing. Um, right, Tony, it's unusual that I let someone come back. One, this is the last one. We've been can I, in a bill. Can yeah, I make sorry. one one quick point just before Councillor Trotton leaves? Um, just firstly to say thank you for coming and and sharing your uh, your story and your vision for Con with us. I think just one point I want to reiterate at this stage because it ties in with what Councillor McClellan said as well. The list we have is not finite and it's not final this is step one in what i think we see as a, an evolving kind of iterative process towards delivering a an asset for the entirety of the county i think kind of the if anything these questions have given me more confidence that what we're doing here has value and is exciting and innovative and i hope that you know th th this will benefit khan in 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 future and i think the same goes for lavastar and we can talk about the minutiae at, at length i think that's an important part of this process and I, I thank Victoria and Terry for, uh, for answering those questions so ably, but I think I don't want to lose sight of the bigger picture here, which is what we can produce if we get this right, which is an asset that will come as a benefit to our, our communities, our residents, our local businesses, our town councils, and the whole, so the whole kind of landscape across Wiltshire. And that's why I'm, I'm so keen to see this happen. And yeah, I think the, the questions we've had today, by and large, give me confidence that what we're doing is is innovative and, and there is a market for it. I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Well, I think every member here has had a chance to speak and it's been quite a nice, as I say, it's been a long debate for an hour. Tony, this is the, this unusual, but you can have one more bite. Uh, thank you, Joe. Very generous. Very generous. Thank you. Um, I wanted to understand, please, are we linked in with Visit Wiltshire? And secondly, as a suggestion, Let's not forget the other organisations within Wiltshire which are not necessarily local authorities. So, for example, the Wiley Valley Arts Trail, the Imber Bus Run, links to the National Trust and the MOD. Um, so, can we make sure that we somehow provide a vehicle to capture those? Thank you.
Um, well, well, thank you, Tony. There's two, two interesting point, points there. Um, I'll start with the question on Visit Wiltshire. Now, we work very closely with Visit Wiltshire. As many of you will know, we, we fund Visit Wiltshire. Myself and Councillor Clewis sit on the, the board of Visit Wiltshire. What we're trying to do here is aligned with, with their work, but at the same time, it's different. As we've already heard from Victoria, their model is, is membership-based. What we're trying to do is produce something here with no, no barriers to entry, either from the, the publishing entity or, or from the user. And we're not, there is no commercial element behind this. I think that's what sets it apart from the work Visit Wiltshire does, which, which I think is very good by and large. Um, there is also a, a second sort of element to this, which is that there is some merit in having an asset which is council-owned and council-managed. It gives us sort of authority over it, autonomy, it protects it, it future-proofs it in the face of potential budget issues we may have down the line. And it means we have an asset which is, you know, essentially we are the, the custodians of, but which exists for the benefit of Wiltshire residents and businesses. And that's why I think we need this distinction between this particular app and the work Visit Wiltshire is doing. Um, that said, we do work closely with them. They are aware of the work we're doing. We update them on this regularly. And there is a path to, to collaborating Sort of in terms of, I mean, at the end of the day, the more publicity we have for wheelchair businesses, wheelchair assets, the better. Thank you. Okay, right. We're going to move to a proposal now. That's been a very long and very interesting debate. And I wish you all the best of luck, Victoria and the team, to get this up and running. I don't know when you're going to plan <laughs> to go fully live, but keep up the good work. So, one, we're going to note the update. Two, to receive a further update by the end of this year, 2023. And three, to update to include an online outline of costs and expenditure, launch the timescales, promotion activity, and an initial assessment of impact. Do I have a seconder to that? Yeah. Oh, and uh, Tony, thank you very much. So all in favour of that, please show your hand. Right. Passed. Thank you very much for that, Victoria and uh, Nabil. And... And everyone that's done that, it's been a great job. And we're going to move on to the next item, which is um, an update on the broadband provision. We've been running an hour, hour and a bit. And like I say, let's get moving. Um, oh, we're going to introduce Kat, uh, Ashley O'Neill this time. And surprise, surprise, Victoria, I think you're still here. So get ready for some more questions. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm going to get started and then I will hand over to uh, Victoria to put some, some more detail around it. But before I do, good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. I hope you all had a, a really lovely break. And I, too, was treated to stories about Paphos when I spoke to uh, Councillor McClellan uh, a number of weeks ago, except that when I did, it was minus 10 outside here. And it definitely wasn't that cold where you were. So. There you go. Not everything was happy then. You blame me. But um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here to update you on the Wiltshire Online programme. That is a programme that has been running since 2013 uh, and has really sought to deliver broadband to premises that were considered commercially non-viable. So for those of you that have been around on this committee uh, for a longer period of time, previous updates uh, to you as a committee are very much focused on the super fast contracts, that's the, the 30 megabit per second contracts, those have now come to an end. In Wiltshire, there were four contracts awarded to upgrade provision or deliver a super fast broadband connection. That has actually resulted in 97,000 properties, premises being upgraded, which is absolutely fantastic progress. Uh, in addition, we were very fortunate, or unfortunate in some ways, but fortunate that to support the economic recovery in Salisbury, Openreach invested to make Salisbury the first full fibre city that was gigabit capable uh, in the UK, and that upgraded approximately 20,000 premises. So now that the previous programmes have come to an end, we don't sort of shut up shop and, and rest on our laurels. There are future programmes that will now seek to deliver gigabit level uh, capability at 900 megabits per second, which is obviously a substantial uh, increase on the sort of the previous contracts. That'll be part of Project Gigabit. The government target is to deliver 85% capability across the UK by 2025, with Wiltshire sitting currently at around 57% capability. 
but that is rapidly rising uh, predominantly through commercial rollouts that are very much picking up pace uh, across the county. In terms of where we are with that, that future programme there, that government programme, Wiltshire actually sits within phase 2B of Project Gigabit. Um, procurement and contracts are due to start this year, 2023. And the approach to the programme, uh, as we have with, with previous programmes and as we will with this one, is to operate on the best value principle. So we're very much looking to deliver broadband to the maximum number of premises in Wiltshire, rather than sort of targeting, targeting specific locations and saying it's here or, or it's there. Uh, in terms of locations, details on that and eligible properties are, are still being delivered by BDUK, which is Building Digital UK, uh, and more detail will come forward in time. If there are properties that are not included in a private commercial build or in the Project Gigabit programme, which you'd think is probably a likely outcome, there'll be some uh, that that's relevant for, a voucher scheme will be available to help contribute towards the costs of provision. So whilst Project Gigabit sounds like it's similar to the Superfast programmes, and it is in some ways, uh, it's very much around targeting much higher speeds, but there are a number of changes to how it's been run previously. That's namely that BDUK will now be the contracting authority for this next <laughs> programme, as they've been formed as an executive agency by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. But regardless of that, from our perspective, there's very little change in the work that we do with the broadband team. We very much work in partnership with BDUK, providing that local intelligence, validating the connections and, and sort of monitoring that contract performance. I'm going to hand over to Victoria Maloney. Uh, who's going to give a, a presentation and take you through a bit more of the detail. But just before I do, I just want to reflect on a few things that I personally am very fortunate to have access to a full fibre broadband connection at 900 megabits per second. But I represent a very rural division, Cowan Rural, and there are many places in my division that don't have access to full fibre broadband. And I hear every day, as I'm sure many of you do, just how much that places a limitation on households. Uh, you know, in, just in everyday life, things that they're unable to do, family that they're not able to connect with, and the frustration around you know, trying to work from home. And I just want to reiterate what I said at Port Council uh, in May 2022, is that you know, I very much recognise the importance of digital connectivity in such a rural county. I certainly meet with the, the team regularly uh, and absolutely make this a priority, and I will continue, as well as the team will, to advocate you know, for Wiltshire residents that we can get access to full fibre broadband for as many properties as possible. But over to you, Victoria. Thank you. And again, just to reflect on that, we certainly see broadband investment as one of the best things we can do for our economy, um, particularly given the changes that have happened in recent years. So as Councillor O'Neill said, um, the programme has run since 2013 um, and has... Sorry, Karen, could we put the slides up? That's run since 2013 and has achieved 97,000 properties being upgraded. Um, we were also fortunate enough to have that open reach investment. I'm definitely presenting it on my screen. Apologies, everyone. Let's see if I can put that back up for you. There we go. So I am not the person that gave the previous updates on the Superfast programme, for those of you that were there. Um, Ian Robinson, Mary Nash and Adrian Grant have all since left the authority um, as the end of the Superfast programme came about. Um, so myself and my colleague Graham are now in charge of the broadband programme and mostly in relation to Superfast, our actions have been around supporting the closure of the contracts. So that's authenticating and confirming the information provided to us by the delivery bodies to allow BDUK to make final payments and close the contracts. Um, the final open reach contract, there were three, is currently in the final stages of closure, and BDUK and GigaClear are currently working through their final change request, which reduces the original contracted premises. Um, there was a funding deadline of March 22. Um, not all the premises have been updated by that time, um, so we've very much been advocating to BDUK that those premises should be considered very strongly in Project Gigabit, um, not taking away from our principle of best value. So coverage levels, um, you heard from Ashley that the target is to deliver 85% by 2025 and 100% by 2030. 
Um, so super fast, we currently have 96.7% coverage. Uh, you can see how that sits against what I hope are some reasonable comparators, Shropshire, Dorset, Cornwall, Devon and Somerset. Um, we do reasonably well, I would say. Um, we're certainly in the middle of that gang. Um, we're not an outlier in either way, um, but our 57% gigabit coverage is high compared to most of those comparators with the exception of Devon and Somerset, who are also in Project Gigabit. So Project Gigabit, we're in phase 2B, but we're actually included in lot 30, uh, which includes Swindon and South Gloucestershire. So it's a government infrastructure programme totaling £5 billion of investment. Um, there's work, there's a lot of work underway at the moment to identify the eligible premises. So the way they do that is they look at information provided by those broadband companies about where they're intending to build anyway. Um, and then they look at the gap and they say, well, is anyone intending to build there? How certain are we that they're going to build there? And from there, we build a list of properties that aren't due to be upgraded. And those are the properties that are eligible for public investment. So the procurement start date was listed in the autumn update as December 22 to February 23. And I can tell you it's not started yet um, with the contract award date of October 23 to December 23. So we do expect that later this year. Um, they're targeting around 84,000 properties and they give a contract value of at least 85 million. However, as above, um, that is Swindon, South Gloucestershire and Wiltshire. Um, so we certainly wouldn't be expecting that level of investment into Wiltshire alone, um, and it entirely depends on how the market responds to this information. So Wiltshire Council has previously been the contracting authority for the Superfast contracts. However, the funding wasn't by and large ours. It was BDUK's funding, some funding from the LEP and some funding from us in the earlier stages. Um, because predominantly the funding was BDUK and the programmes were BDUK and the data was BDUK, um, BDUK will be the contracting authority this time. Um, we think that will work better uh, because it is their funding, um, but it represents very little change to the work that we do, which is still around substantiating the claims that the providers make, um, sharing local intelligence about what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so, for example, Giganet were advertising in devices this year that they had full fibre coverage. Um, and it's about sharing that market intelligence because GigaNet actually hadn't responded to the open market review. So it's just about closing those gaps and making sure that what we know locally is shared with the national bodies. Um, we've also had input into the social value question for when they do tender, um, which is about how the contract contributes to our local outcomes. Um, and it is very much focused on economic recovery and helping people through cost of living and the COVID recovery. Outside of the main Project Gigabit, there will be vouchers available for both domestic and non-domestic properties. Um, previously, uh, a, a domestic property could get 1,500 and a non-domestic property could get 3,500. Both voucher costs have been increased to 4,500. That change is as of the 5th of December 22. Unfortunately, they cannot backdate that change. Um, and then we're currently in that transition period. Um, because Wilch is also in a procurement, stage. Um, there are times when vouchers are not available to our residents simply because BDUK needs to freeze the information it's got so it can actually do the analysis. So you may have heard from some of your communities earlier that they were told that vouchers weren't available. As soon as Project Gigabit gets underway and the information is more certain, the vouchers will reopen. The final thing to touch on is the Wiltshire Online website. It is out of date. It's one of the websites we've learned lessons from um, because <coughs> it's not wholly set up in the Wiltshire Council fashion. So we will be retiring it um, and we will be putting the project gigabit information up onto a new portal. In the meantime, please use broadband at wiltshire.gov.uk for any queries. Um, we are here to answer them to the best of our ability. Most of the detailed information is still being worked through, so I'm afraid we don't have that to share. So in conclusion, um, the Superfast programme is closing. Project Gigabit is continuing according to the programme. Uh, the voucher scheme has recently relaunched with the higher values of 4,500 and the Wiltshire online website will be replaced, but the broadband mailbox is available. And I've just put a reminder of those dates down there. Thank you, Victoria. Um, to get your dates, I've got two hands up. Um, Councillor Jones, Councillor Matthew. So, Councillor Jones, Bob. Oh, thank you, Jim. Um, interesting. 
but it doesn't give the answers. Uh, I'm going to be parochial very vaguely. We've got two estates in Cricklade. One side's been done by Giga Clear, the other hasn't been touched at all. So the people naturally want to know what's happening. There doesn't seem to be any way of getting that information to be told what, what is happening. Not at this stage, no. The information that's been published is postcode level data about whether or not a private company plans to build to the area, and I can send the link to that. Um, but at the moment, there's either a planned private build or there may possibly be a public build, but we don't know the premises included in that public build at this time. It just seems obscure that the, the, the company's there on one side of the street doing the job and on the other side they're not going to, or well, don't appear to. It's entirely down to the company's private um, cost plans. You know, it isn't something that we have control over. Um, where premises have been left out, they will have access to a form of public support. But what I can't tell you is whether they'll need to pursue vouchers independently or whether they'll be included in Project Gigabit. It's quite possible, taking the parochial a little bit out of it, it's probably happening in other places in the county as well. So. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very similar. So I, don't, um, so I don't want to go into detail on where they are and where they are. Councillor Matthew. Victoria, thank you very much. And it's it's great to hear about the rollout and uh, this is obviously something that's needed. Um, my question might uh, raise an eyebrow in, the, in that I'm going to speak in favour of free market capitalism for this. Um, and that is, I, what I, from what I've seen, um, that there are some quite good entry rates for one of the companies. Um, but that in the following year, the price goes up dramatically. Um, so what does this mean that Wiltshire residents will effectively be locked into particular companies in the years to come? Or is there a plan to allow other companies to have access to the network so that there can be, uh, you know, a competition between them? Or is there a danger, and this is what I, I fear, that that effectively we we end up with monopoly capitalism and you're, you're stuck with a company that can charge whatever it wants. Um, love to hear your answer. Thank you. So I'm afraid that's definitely a matter for Ofcom and not for us as an authority. Um, who is allowed to operate on the network and how they operate on the network is not something we have any control over at a local level. What I would point out, and it's definitely outside the scope of this report, but I'm happy to talk about it, is that there is a plan for a copper switch off so the phone networks eventually will move from copper to digital with the gigabit technology. Obviously, it can't happen until we've got the gigabit technology. And as part of that, Ofcom has said that affordable tariffs must be available to residents. So that is their position. I'm, I'm happy to put that in writing because uh, they've sent it to us. So that would be that that would be useful. But it would also be useful to know if more than one company will Will, will be available or if basically because you're in one particular village or town that you have to use one provider. So it's a matter for that company and their deal with Ofcom. Um, in most cases, I think multiple packages are available and multiple providers are available once the technology has been built. Um, we're certainly not aware of anyone that has a solo monopoly um, once they've built out, but it is a matter for them, BD UK and Ofcom. Um, Ashley, I'll let you come back now. Sorry, I might have been for the previous question. Otherwise, I might forget <laughs> what's going on in the debate. Two points I just want to address. The one that Councillor Jones raised, that you're going to find this across the county. You will see situations where you know, one side of the street has been done with full fibre, the other hasn't, because where you've got commercial rollouts, it's very much based on, on where they can make the numbers work. It doesn't seem to make sense to us, but there will be a reason why they've chosen to do one and not the other. Obviously, this programme will be very much focused on the ones that have been missed and are not commercially viable. And, but where you've got commercial rollouts, that, that happens entirely outside the scope of, of what goes on uh, within this programme. So that was the first point I just wanted to make. And to come back to you, I don't know I was going to call you Brian. I shouldn't do that, should I? Call you Brian. Um, yeah, ultimately, regardless of whether or not the infrastructure is delivered commercially uh, or through a state aid funded program, the approach to the infrastructure is going to be the same and the same limitations will apply. So if you take two of the, the more well-known network builders in this area, Openreach, you know, they are 
effectively operate as a sort of a wholesaler, really, where people can pick and choose a package uh, from the, whatever ISP that they want that has the ability to connect in, into that network. And the same principle applies with, with your GigaClear as well. They're an ISP in their own right, but also they, you know, they operate their stuff on a wholesale basis. So you do have other options there, so you're not locked directly into a supplier, but it's very much not a matter for us. It's not something that we can control. Yes, we have the ability to provide you with information on that and, and signpost you, but it's, it's not something I would be comfortable uh, getting involved in too much of the detail. It's very much an Ofcom uh, and government matter. Okay, there's no other hands, I don't think. So, um, oh, sorry, Councillor Jackson, apologies, didn't see it. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, I understand that the fibre part of this broadband rollout is coming to an end, this programme. Have I understood that correctly? No, so the super fast element has ended, which is 30 megabytes, and that took fibre to the cabinet and copper from the cabinet to your house. Project Gigabit, which is sometimes referred to as full fibre, but people use these terms interchangeably. Project Gigabit takes fibre to the cabinet and then fibre to your house. It's a much more complicated build. Um, one of the things we know has caused issue in terms of that discrepancy between streets is about way leave permission, because the company needs a way leave to work in, on a landlord's land. If you can imagine trying to get way leave permission for every single property they've got to connect, it's going to be quite challenging. So fibre is used confusingly and interchangeably, this is around getting fibre all the way to your house, um, not just to the cabinet. Sure. Uh, my question was going to be whether or not um, there's any potential for um, satellite provision um, to fill the gaps where either copper or fibre isn't going to be available. So there haven't been any announcements from BT UK on that, um, but I know previously we've looked at alternative provision where we know that there's a real challenge. Um, it's certainly something that we're open to, and if we, you know, see communities coming forward with particular demand, uh, it's, you know, a conversation we're happy to have. What I would say at the moment is the data sets are in flux, so we can't even tell you where there's going to be a problem or if there's going to be a problem optimistically. Um, so we do need to get to the point where actually the procurement is set and we know where they're going, uh, so we know where they're not going. Um, and then it's a conversation about, well, how do we get there? Obviously, vouchers are going to be our first point of call because they're supported. Uh, but we know we've got particular challenges. What I would say as well is um, this is the broadband programme, but we do keep an eye on mobile provision. Uh, we're particularly aware of challenge with our military colleagues uh, in the Tidworth and Lark Hill areas. And we're kind of working with them to explore what we can do in partnership. We have no delivery role in that, but, you know, we're really keen to help where we can and just broker relationships. So, again... If there was a project coming forward that was looking at satellite or looking at different methods of provision, we would engage in those conversations and see what we could do to help. Thank you, Jim. Right, so we've got a couple of recommendations, got another hands. Um, one is to note the update and two, to receive a further update by the end of this year, 2023. Um, could a proposal for that from um, Ian McClellan and seconded by Councillor Matthew. All in favour of that? Right. I think, I think you might be nearly done now, Victoria. Thanks for giving us, you can stay if you like, but thanks for your great time and, uh, and two great presentations as usual with you. Very assured lady. Right, item eight is the Wiltshire Council's Housing Board Annual Report. Um, Councillor Alfred's not with us today, the Cabinet for Housing Strategic Assets. I think we've got Simon Hendy, Director of Assets and Commercial and Development. Um, we may have somebody else here as well, so Ashley's here as well. So, Simon, um, you want to, or Ashley can introduce it. Mr Chairman, I, I'm just going to say a couple of words before I hand over to Simon, just say that Councillor Phil Orford does send his apologies that he's not able to be with you today. Um, very much would have liked to have been with you. Simon will will take you as a committee through the report and you know, any sort of questions he can answer, he will. If there's anything that Simon can't answer because of the, the particular nature of them, I'm very happy to take those back to Councillor Alford uh, and make sure that he follows follows them up with a reply. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, That's Simon. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just going to say a few words by way of introduction. I mean, the report really is is like the sort of apophical cure it's a good in part, disappointing in others. Um, obviously, the the report covers the period from October 21 to November 22. You'll see in the report that um, although we were successful in recruiting some um, 
resident members to the Housing Board over that period. Unfortunately, they've moved home. They no longer qualify as residents of the council and therefore have had to step down. We're in the process of recruiting new resident members at the moment, adverts are out, and we're hopeful that uh, we will be able to be successful in securing some new resident board members on that basis. Um, the major impact um, on the service and customers, you won't be surprised to hear, is, is in relation to the economy. And one aspect that's not actually included in the report, which I thought may have been of interest to you, we have a tenancy sustainment team. And the whole purpose of that tenancy sustainment team is to maximise the income of our customers. And so far this year, up to um, the 15th of December, um, that team have been successful in securing over £407,000 in additional benefits for our customers, £107,000 in backdated benefit for our customers, £86,000 in external grants, so grants from charitable organisations for our customers, and, and been successful in supporting our customers to uh, uh, clear £24,000 of third-party debt, so over £625,000 of additional income for our customers. And clearly in the current economic climate, that's a real benefit for them, but clearly to the service as well, which I'm going to go on to, to explain. Some of the areas which we have been successful over the last year is our housing energy efficiency programme. We were successful in securing £500,000 from government support work on improving the energy efficiency of the 100 most inefficient properties that the council owns. Our council house build programme is making progress. We have planning permission for some of the sites which are going to be taking off-site manufactured products, the carbon zero homes. And we've already secured and uh, delivered 30 new homes this year, including six one-bedroom flats for people who have learning disabilities. Some of the more disappointing aspects are around service performance, and, and there's two aspects to that. Firstly, you'll see in the report, we undertake a biannual STAR survey, which is a customer satisfaction survey. Now, the results on the STAR survey have gone down from the last, last, last um, survey undertaken two years ago. Now, we, from the organisation that uh, provides that survey for us, they undertake that nationally. We're aware that the results have gone down across the country, but we must be complacent about that. We have an um, action plan in place to address some of those issues, and we had that in place before the survey was undertaken. Some of the actions that um, are in train at the moment wouldn't have had the opportunity to bite in terms of service delivery, so we don't expect them to... Um, show an improved performance in 2022, but our hope and expectation is that we will see improved performance in the customer satisfaction results in 24. That's the basis of the survey. Um, you'll see in the report that we've made um, great strides in digital um, access for our customers. Over half of our customers now we communicate with digitally. They have the ability to contact us um, via the iHousing portal where they can tell us about repairs they want to report, they can look at their rent account, all those sort of things. Um, I've already mentioned the um, action plan that we have in place around the housing revenue account business plan. And a part of that is we uh, have in place a redesign of our service where we're moving away from a delivery of a service which is functionally based to one that's geographically based around neighborhoods. Something that's not in the report that you'll be aware of um, happened the tail end of the last calendar year because of the tragic death of the two-year-old boy in um, Rochdale, the emphasis around damp and mould in people's homes. We've reviewed all our policies on that. We had to re um, provide reports to the social housing regulator about what our policies were, how we'd address that. There's been a significant increase in customers contacting us on the issues of um, damp and mould and condensation in their homes, as you would expect because of the prominence that that issue generated in the, in the national media. The last year, you have, have information on our key performance indicators, and these are disappointing at the moment, uh, primarily around um, our response to repairs and our response to bringing empty properties, void properties back into use. And the reason for that is that um, in the first part of the year, uh, we had a high number of vacancies in our property services. So you'll be aware that we have our own property services colleagues that provide repairs and undertake work to void properties. Um, quite frankly, we were, didn't have a competitive offer in the marketplace to attract people to come and work for the council. We've changed that, so we have recast the job descriptions. They've been regraded, and they are now much more competitive in the marketplace. And recently, we've been successful in attracting six skilled operatives to come and work for us, and we have an ongoing advert out there to attract people. 
We've also found it very difficult to um, attract contractors to come and work for us as well. And this is not a problem just unique to the council. Other housing providers are being confronted with this problem at the moment. There's just a lack of contractors out there to undertake building work. That has impacted on the speed at which we can turn empty properties around, void properties. Um, we have to steal ourselves because that performance will get worse because you know properties have been sitting empty will get round and i can tell you the end of quarter three we are turning more properties back into into letting than we were in quarter two but of course they've been empty for a longer period of time so there'll be a period of time where that uh the, the time at which their void will increase before it comes back down again the other impact is around is around the uh number of repairs that we've been able to complete within the target times which is below target um, we are seeing at the end of quarter three a slight improvement in that. And what is encouraging, especially around um, the council's property services, direct labour organisation, the number of repairs that are completed right first time is increasing. And that's clearly something that's of most importance to, uh, to our customers. The other area that um, is below target at the moment, and again, wouldn't be a surprise to you because it is, uh, to a certain extent, con consequence of the economic climate is the uh, level of arrears are increasing and are above, above target, specifically... Uh, the uh, level of arrears which are being generated by customers that are um, reliant on the use of universal credit to help pay their rent. Clearly, there's an inbuilt issue, a delay in terms of payment of universal credit, which catches up over time. But there's an inbuilt delay wh whilst people get to their first UC payment. And of course, a lot of our customers will be moving on to UC over, over the next 12 months. So overall, some, some things to celebrate in terms of um, some of the things that we've done around um, improvements to the stock and that, but some disappointing performance. But as I said, overall, um, although not complacent, we would, we would point to the impact of the economy at the moment on, the, on those performance measures. I'll finish there, I have to take any Okay, thank you for that. Um, many of you read the report, we'll have a look at it. I know it's been sort of a funny period to read it, but um, I am any hands up at the moment, so. Mel. It's a, it's a minor question. Just on the iHousing portal, where you give those figures, I, I don't have any understanding of how many residents there are in total. So if you say to me there are 1,900 registered users, I don't know what percentage that is. I don't know if it's possible to give some idea of context around what these numbers are as a percentage. Sure, thanks for that. There's roughly 5,250 um, tenants at any point in time. So um, the, the, the um, number of iHousing um, users in November 22, 2467, as I said, it's roughly half of all our customers now are digitally engaged, which, you know, if you equate that to half of all customers of the council in relation to council taxes, so that's quite a high number. Um, anyone else? No? Okay, so, oh, Councillor Jackson, sorry. Well, just to say, uh, just to congratulate the team on the um, improvement, not improvements, on the um, success they've had in getting benefit uh, clawbacks. Yeah, I've got um, Councillor Graham Wright, you're online, so um, I see you've got your hand up, so I'll let you ask the question. Then. Oh, there he is, he's appeared. Yeah. Yeah, Graham. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, just really wanted to say to Simon, thank you for your honest and informative report, because it was, uh, you didn't uh, pull any punches on that one. And it's really just to, as I do have a lot in my ward, and this is a, a local issue for me, but um, I'm sure it applies to all of the council tenants. Um, it's about communication. Whilst things are not brilliant, and you've, ex you've explained that, you know, good communication resolves a lot of issues and your communication within the council departments for housing is poor, to say the least. If you want more, Give me a call outside and uh, uh, we can discuss it. Thank you very much, Jerry. We and, and I just responded to that because in the um, Star Server report, our performance on communication with tenants has gone down. We've responded to that immediately. We used to have something called Housing Matters, which was a um, bi monthly, quite big newsletter that went out to people. We still provide that once a year on a hard, hard copy because we're aware that some customers particularly like that. But we've moved to providing a more frequent email because, as you can see through our, the digital contact we've got to customers, more frequent email to all our customers. And that's got a much better response from customers. And it's included things like um, Tesco's of, um, of 
um, sponsored a, um, a, a food hamper every month, and that's encouraged people to read it. And we're getting a much better response. So we, we've accepted that around communication, but changed the way we do it. OK, thank you. OK, Councillor Jackson. Tony, did you? Yeah. No, I've, I've already said my piece. OK, sorry, I've lost the, lost the thread. Councillor, did you, you had one crack? I you. do have a question, thank you. Come on in. <laughs> um, it's uh, really around the issue of um, prepayment meters. And I was wondering if you've got a handle on or a knowledge of the proportion of our tenants that are on prepayment meters, um, thinking about the issue of, of uh, you know, damp and what have you. And, and also, you know, what, what's been shown is that often people on prepayment meters are paying more for their electricity than anyone else. Um, do, do, do you happen to know approximately what proportion of our tenants are, are, are on prepayment meters? No, I don't know a number, although it will be a high number um, because of the economic circumstances. Um, what we have done in this last year, we um, installed solar panels on a number of customers' homes when feed-in tariffs were still available, and that generated between sort of twenty to £30,000 a year income to the council. Um, what we've done is we've set up a fuel hardship fund for customers. So if they're really struggling, um, our tenancy sustainment team will do what they can to try and maximise their income, see what they can do. We're using that fuel hardship fund in some instances to clear debts because the problem is that you can't move off a prepayment meter unless you've got a good history with the energy supplier. So we're using some of those payments to clear people's debts so we can actually help them move off prepayment meters onto normal, normal not prepayment meters, normal so utilities. I will support you on prepayment meters. I've gone 35 years without a smart meter in my place, and I've got one, and I wish I could get a sledgehammer to it now, because old-fashionedly reading the meters, you can send it and you can work it out. But for some unknown reason, my electric's gone shooting up in a heck of a heck of a way. So don't have them if you do. don't have them. Case number McClellan. Sounds like a dodgy meeting you had before. <laughs> um, yes, Chairman, thank you. Uh, yeah, my, my question could have many, but the, 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 I think the biggest one is you explained quite rightly, Simon, that the uh, time lag of turnaround of property to get them relet is, is slipping again. Uh, these things are cyclic. You know, I can remember long times, then the action plans come in and they go short times and it's for obvious reasons and lots of reasons fading out again now. Is, is there a, a, a plan that we now have to bring this back down again? Because like all things, time is the money in all directions, isn't it? Yes, thank you, Chair. Through you, Chair. We do have a specific plan around voids. As I said, we're in, we've active recruitment to get people into our property services because we target our staff at doing the void properties. We're identifying void properties which have a minimum amount of work that we can get turned around quickly. We're identifying void properties where there's work we can do. And also, when we let the property to the tenant, we'll say, well, we haven't done all the work, but we are going to do this as soon as you move in so we can get it let. So we're very conscious of this because it loses a lot of money to the housing revenue account, which is money that customers don't get the benefit of. So we are targeting, targeting this. But unfortunately, I said we have to seal ourselves because it will go up before it comes down because there are a number of properties in the system that haven't been let. They've been empty for quite some time at the moment. OK, um, we're all right. No one else got the hand up. So we're going to the um, recommendations. One note, the annual report, 21, 22, and two to receive the next Wiltshire Housing Board Annual Report 22-23. Um, are they happy with that? Everyone happy? Yeah? Okay. All in favour? Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you, Ashley, for hanging on there for that one, for standing in for Philip. Um, we'll move straight on then to um, the number nine, which is the Climate Emergency Task Group update. And there we are patiently waiting. There is Graham. Do you just want to take us through that one then, please? Uh, absolutely fine, Jerry. Um Two things really. You've obviously got a report there, but on page two, I would just like to refer you to the uh, change adaption action plan um, and make a few comments on that and then ask you to look at our forward work program where we are looking at what has the biggest impact on the, the climate strategy within Wiltshire Council. Uh, and obviously we are focusing on the reports that come back through Cabinet. So in essence, uh, we were asked by the Council's climate team to review the 
a current climate change adaption plan, which was absolutely years and years out of date. It was last revised in 2016. And we came up in essence with six recommendations. So I'd just like to highlight those six and then ask you if you have any questions on our forward work programme. So number one was the existing plan should be completely rewritten because um, it's completely out of date and it doesn't have the right context anymore. The plan continues its risk-based approach, concentrating upon key risks. Other risk management documents should be integrated and coordinated to avoid any overlaps and possibly by maintaining a central risk register. Uh, number four was the consideration be given to how the plan is developed with partners internally and externally. Number five, it is clearer about what mechanisms that it will be in place to support the and include organisations and businesses within Wiltshire. This is more of a Wiltshire wide thing. Then the plan to develop at pace as it will have an impact on emerging policies and plans. So we keep as a task group, we keep coming back to the local plan and the local transport plan and, and what have you. So that's the update on our recent activity. And if I could just go to the forward work program and mention three areas that I want to emphasize and then come back to you if that's OK with any questions. Um, we, we're really going to focus on zero carbon housing. Uh, the local plan, which rolls on and on, but we really do need to get our teeth into what that's going to deliver or not. And the local transport plan. There are many others on our task group forward work program, and we do thank the Environment Select Committee for allowing us to continue to do our work. Do you have any any questions, please, Jerry? Well, we're over the floor. Thank you very much for that report, Graham. Um, talking about transport, I did have a bus driver who'd finished their shift, by the way, a Salisbury Red driver for a pint, and they just said that all fares in the county at the moment are £2 anywhere you go. So what they're trying to do is get more people on public transport and get them out of their cars. So let's see if that's successful. Um, any questions from anyone around here for Graham? He's been sat there patiently listening to us. Um, do you, Graham, you've... Oh, Ian, you've nearly got away with it. Case from the club. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Graham. Happy New Year Thank to you. you. Um, yeah. One of the things that Simon Hendy mentioned just now uh, that slipped away in a sentence was that um, we provided some solar panels uh, while the, the fit of feeding tariffs was still going uh, and, and, uh, and then it brought £30,000 into the council, which is a, a very good thing for the council. But uh, I thought the motivation was to try and assist with our customers um, and people that we house in our council houses to uh, offset some of their electric too. And I just wondered what, what the view of the uh, of your committee are on, because I thought there was a much bigger programme at one point for solar panels. That seems to, in the way Simon phrased it, have ended with, with it. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Ian. Yeah, we've always been hugely focused on solar and we've found it difficult over the years that we've been running a task group to understand why we haven't done more and why we haven't uh, engaged more. There is a, a solar together policy that the council is running through, so we need to see how that evaluates out. But we haven't lost any focus on the the potential of, uh, you know, the sun burning away out in there in the galaxy and then us not using that, harnessing that power. So, um, you know, don't for any minute think here that we've, uh, we've, it's not on our agenda because it is. But thank you for the question. Just... Yeah, come back on it because there's definitely no solar here outside at the moment. <laughs> okay, yeah, just a quick one. Um, how many legs have you got, actually, Graham? And the reason I ask is that in, in the picture I see one, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, 27 walking sticks there. Oh, <laughs> yes, right. No, uh, that's my wife's collection of walking sticks, yeah. But I only okay. have the two, but I do use them wisely. But thank you, Ian. So he's obviously given you a lot of stick over Christmas. Right, anyway, yeah, yeah, boom, boom. Thank you. Um, did Councillor, uh, uh, I've got Mr Blair Pillin, the Cabinet Member for many things. So, Ian, Happy New Year. So I wasn't here for any of these items, but I'm just picking up on what Ian McLaren was saying and, and not trying to kind of pick about it. I, I'm not sure that what Simon was saying 
is is what you were saying then. So I'm offering to get Simon to clarify what he, the point he was making about the 30K and the solar panels, etc. I just think I was picking up myself. There was a bit of confusion about what he said and therefore your question there. Okay, well, thank you for that. So I'll get that clarified. Thank you for that intervention. That's, that's pretty good. That's um, fine. So we're just, um, I think we'll just have to note the report again. Is it just uh, one note, the update on the task group activity provided, and two, to note the task group's draft board work plan, which we look at at Appendix 1. Anyone, or a hand up to support that? Yep, and seconded. Thank you very much. And thank you, Graham, for being patient. And you can get back to your walking with your sticks. Well, I, I know you have 10 minutes left, Jerry, so I was as quick as I possibly I'm, could be. You know I'm there. But I, do, I must add, from an OSMC perspective, I think it's really good questions and a, and a good select committee meeting. Well done to all. Thank you. Thank you for that, Graham. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, so now we just go on very quickly onto the forward work plan. That's available on pages 37 to 44. Um, can I invite any comments on that plan? Is there anyone that's thinking we've got anything missing or... You want to take forward? I'll give you a few seconds to look at it. Um, if you're happy with it, um, then I'd like to move forward that no, we note the planning. Can I have a second over that, please? Yeah. Okay, Bob Jones, Councillor Jones, thank you very much. Um, well, I think that basically, there's no urgent items. I don't do urgent items. Date of the next meeting, 14th of March, 2023. That'll soon come round. It'll be spring, the sun will be shining. And the budget will be set, and we'll all be happy days, happy living ever after. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you all for attending. Happy New Year again. Safe journey home in the nice rain. Thank you. Meeting closed.